Welcome back to the next Smart Suite Showcase. If you're new here, I'm your host, Nate Montgomery. In this series, we share the ways that customers are using our platform. Today is going to deviate a little bit from the normal episode. And the fact that instead of going into an example use case, I'm going to be sharing some documentation standards for new solutions that you're creating for your work, your team, or other teams. This video is meant to be a comprehensive guide to understand how to effectively set up your solutions, which includes some best practices of solution setup from customers that are really engaging with our product. If you'd like written documentation, you can also follow along with a link in the description below. We're gonna start off with solutions at whole. Right now we're in a project management solution that I downloaded from the template library. You can access this by going to start with a template, go into project management and downloading it here. Let's go back into the solution where we're brought into a projects by type view in our projects table. The first thing we're gonna highlight is the solution at whole. Step one is to effectively name your solution. To accurately reflect the business process, workflow, or data that it contains, you wanna aim for a concise name, typically under three words. This ensures it's memorable, identifiable, and accurately conveys the business process, workflow, or data that it encompasses. Next up, we have our solution guides. Clicking our solution dropdown, we're brought to our solution guide, which is meant to be a guide of how to understand and use the solution at hand. An effective solution should have a filled out solution guide, including detailed descriptions of the tables within the solution, clarifying the purpose and the role of them. It can also include details on the workflow of the solution and how records would move across the tables. An example, the flow of how projects would create things like tasks, deliverables, change requests, and status reports. Ultimately, how the sequence of operations work within that business process. You can also incorporate supporting resources such as videos here that act as guides of how to proceed within the solution and examples of how various components function in practical scenarios when using the solution. Next, let's talk about tables, which hold information about one type of item. The table should accurately represent the item that is being tracked. Because tables can encompass multiple types of that item, this is generally meant to be not a specific name, and ideally this should be limited to less than two words. For example, projects, tasks, deliverable, change requests, status reports. Once you name the table, it's important to go down into the table dropdown and go to this record naming where we are able to customize the record terminology for this table. Change this to project, we're able to see new project shows up here, which enhances clarity and relevance for users using this table and solution. Next up, we're going to move on to views within a table. A well-configured table should include at least six to 10 different views tailored to the nature of the items in the table. For example, something like an events table might feature several calendar or timeline-based views to reflect its time-based nature, whereas a task or project table might have more grid views. It's generally advisable for all tables to include at least one grid view, providing a comprehensive and structured overview of the information. When configuring the view names in a solution, you want to choose names that reflect the characteristics of the view at hand. And these should describe the specific configurations of that view. For example, since we are grouping by type, a projects by type is a great and appropriate name for this view at hand. We recommend to keep the view names under five words here. View descriptions, which you can access from this dropdown here, can also be used to provide context, helping users understand what they're looking at. This should be clear, concise, and relevant to those using this view. The other important view is our record view, which is built inside each table. Each table is going to have a different record view. The record view is that zoomed in picture of a row or a record, and it's critical to organize the fields effectively for easy navigation and comprehension. The first thing that you wanna utilize is our sections inside of this record view. Sections are used to, to break up the information in the fields within a record, and you can group fields within those sections and collapse them by default. A good setup will have general information at the forefront, by placing the general and most used fields at the top of the record view, which includes things like the primary field, the status, and main details. Sections under that should be used strategically to bucket fields of information into relevant groupings. These should make sense in the fact that they guide the team throughout the information in a logical sense. Going into our section settings, our collapse by default setting can be used to maintain a clear and uncluttered interface for these record views that allows users to expand each section only when needed, helping them focus on specific information without being too overwhelmed. You also have the ability to customize the page layout. Going into our page settings, you'd wanna pick the right page layout based on the nature of the fields in your record view. For example, if you have a lot of text heavy or qualitative information, a 70-30 layout may balance the information 
in a more sensible way. But if you have a very simple record view, a single column may be the best choice. The goal is to present the information in an efficient way. If there are some fields that are used for calculations and reporting that are not needed to be referenced by the general users, you can go into our fields and hide the fields from showing up in this record view. If you're trying to hide some of the calculations related to this project budget, you can click hide field on the right here. Moving back over to our views, let's talk a little bit about each view type and some steps of how to configure them effectively. We're gonna start off with a grid view. It starts with selecting appropriate fields and having enough fields displayed to cover the page to make sure there is no white space. In this example, we have 12 fields displaying which covers the page and we can scroll to the right to show the rest of the fields. And if you have a handful of fields, the choice of field should relate to the view at hand. So if we were focused in a project financials grid view, it would make sense to display the fields that are related to the financials versus other information that might not be related. Applying groupings in grid view is essential to showcase the relational dynamics of data and help show the groupings of information within categories or types. Commonly used fields for grouping are your status, single selects, multiple selects. It's key within your views that you have records of data to show the solution in a complete scenario. Typically, you want to have at least 12 to 15 records to fill the page. Next up, our view should be used to help visualize the type of item you're tracking with some basic information. In our fields to display, we only need a few important fields to be displayed onto these card views to maintain a desired side of the cards. We don't want as many fields as you would use in a grid view here. Utilize the cover photo of an image if we're tracking something that has images, such as our deliverables or our staff. Linking our photo here is going to have these images show up on the cards. The cover images should be close to a 16-10 ratio. More details on that below. Kanban view should follow similarly to a card view where you're not displaying too many fields, but the main purpose of the Kanban view is to incorporate the column grouping as well as a swim lane grouping if that makes sense based on how you're trying to consume the data. The next view type is map view. Map view should be utilized to help visualize items geographically. Anytime you have an address field within a table, it typically makes sense to have a map view that reflects those addresses within the table. Next up, we have a timeline view. They help show items across periods of time. Should be used if you have a due date date range field where you need to show time. Usually if there's one of those, timeline is a great option. You can select that date here. Should be used here to help visualize the difference differences between the items on the timeline. For example, we can spotlight to show the stoplight status of different items on this timeline. Forms should start with a name that resonates with those that are filling out the form. And secondly, since this is going to be sent out to other people, you want to make sure you're changing the name of the field to accurately instruct and represent something that an outside user or an external party is going to fill out. You can add help text or instructions for each of the fields to help clarify what it is. And you can customize the form's appearance by adding your logo or adding sections and conditional logic. Moving back to tasks, we're going to look at a Gantt view now. If you have a dependency field inside of your table, you should be utilizing a Gantt view here to show the dependencies and the breakdown of the work across time. Once again, this spotlight feature of being able to select a field allows you to easily identify the color for the phases or tasks within this game view. If you move to settings, you can choose to show dependency arrows, which show visually how dependencies work within this view, as well as task labels to show the names of the records that are showing up in this view. Next up, we're going to go into our chart view. We have a handful of different chart types, so each one is going to be used based on what exactly you're trying to accomplish. But some key things to note is whenever you're customizing the color scheme of your charts, we recommend using this second bar here. It's more visually appealing and to pick the right chart type based on the reporting you're type trying to do. Specific chart details are going to be in the documentation link below. Check those out if you are interested. One other thing that also relates to charts is our dashboard because we can embed widgets or charts that go inside of this dashboard. And you're looking at an example of exactly that. Dashboards serve as a central point for accessing resources, viewing charts, monitoring metrics, and should be tailored to meet the needs of a specific team. But it's sometimes important to use some standard formatting for clarity efficiency. We like to recommend using metric widgets and show them at the top, like presented in this dashboard here. They're good for summarizing data and showing comparisons over time. They're clickable and can look good when distributed across the top of the dashboard. Using charts also is a great practice in arranging the charts like presented below. The metrics here in this solution offers a good and concise representation of this data. The central widget of dashboards are effective when they're showing a very critical chart such as a bar chart or column chart. In this example, project budget versus actual, which is a pretty important data comparison. But if it is more of a working dashboard, then using a grid view in this place 
is very effective as well. Embedded grid views are also very important to utilize within the dashboard to display records of information that are directly related to the other components of this dashboard at hand to ensure you can understand the chart visuals with the actual underlying records of data. It is also very important with embedded grid views that you filter down the information to show only the most relevant records at hand. So for example, in this all active projects grid view, we are filtering down and only showing active projects, no historical data to really focus at this high level dashboard. And the naming of the widgets should be clear, concise and a good representation of the widget at hand. These are all good examples of that. One last bit when working with images, especially those that you're showing in card view, going back into our page settings and going to our record cover image, and picking the photo to show up within a record is also a great practice to really complete the feel and look of this record view. And that is going to wrap up this video for Smart Suites solution standards when configuring a new solution for your team, for other teams, and how to name, have ample data, configure views, and use Smart Suites unique features to present solutions in their fullest and best form. Once again, if you want to see the documentation and the steps, there's a link in the description below. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.